Take a young boy for Bengal Tigers and some mind-blowing digital technology and you've got the makings of the latest book turned film to hit the big screen, The Life of Pi. I'm Wendy Bounds and here on Off Duty we're digging into what it takes to pull off a successful adaptation. We talked to one of the Life of Pi stars, Irfan Khan, about why he found his part so difficult and why he put off reading the book for so long. Also, a look at some of the most inspired and idiotic book-to-film adaptations from our Wall Street Journal film critic, Joe Morgenstern. But first, to get you in the mood, let's reconnect with some memorable movie animals, real and fake, along with a few curious facts about them you might not know. shenanigans take place in a hilarious new Hollywood movie called Bedtime for Bonzo, starring Ronald Regan, Diana Lynn, and Bonzo, that amazing chimp. That's right, Mr. Bigglesworth. We're back. Imagine my delight. Irfan Khan plays the grown-up Pi in the new Life of Pi film, but he won't be an unfamiliar face to American viewers, having won key roles in films from Slumdog Millionaire to The Amazing Spider-Man. I talked with him here at the Wall Street Journal and learned why this part in Pi forced him to totally upend his acting method. He's delivered powerful performances in Hollywood films from Slumdog Millionaire and The Amazing Spider-Man to A Mighty Heart with Angelina Jolie. And now actor Irfan Khan, he is pushing his limits again in the new movie The Life of Pi, where he plays a grown-up Pi, a boy who is shipwrecked with a Bengal tiger for 227 days. Welcome to the Wall Street Journal, Irfan. Appreciate Thank your being you. here. So had you read the book Life of Pi before you were in the movie? I've heard about the book. But I never read it until um, Ang offered me the part. And even then, you know, when he 
I was not eager to read it until I'm signed for the for the part because what happens as an actor you start uh, investing emotionally to the subject you start getting you know attached to the subject unless and until you know you are sure that you are going to do you know after that I started reading the book what did you think after you read it you cannot imagine what's what's uh, what's there in the book you know it's it's, it's beyond beyond your imagination and the kind of things he deals with uh, on the surface is, is about a boy and tiger in the boat and you know uh, but it it deals with so so issues which are which are so so intrinsic with human beings you know which are necessity of human beings since they are born in, on this planet your role is tricky in that you're playing an older version of pi in the yeah. movie um, there's obviously a young man playing the younger version for much of the film do you all have to coordinate how you act this role since you are the same person i've always wondered about that when there's a younger and an older version of a character in this film particularly there was no need to do that hmm. because you know Ang has done the casting, so he has done those kind of things automatically. If there would have been a need, Ang Lee would have definitely told us that, you know, watch him, see him, you know, so we were relying on him. And he had, uh, the younger part, he had very little acting experience, if any, before he played this role. Do yeah. you think that helped make him a better pie? I think people who have never acted, people who are fresh, they bring in something very raw, which is rare which uh, it's difficult for an for a, for a practicing actor to bring that because practicing actor sometimes has his own you know a method and uh, that becomes a cage after a point you right. know you don't you are no more a child like you're no more you're always you have a kind of system backing up you know a system which which is which uh, you know which secures you right so you start relying on that and that's a kind of you know that's also becomes your limitation i think the kind of age he was in and he was given this part he this part this whole experience will change him for his life have you found a part for you that you carry with all your life yet have you found the part that you think is the epitome? Yeah, I think theme? there were parts was, which uh, has changed my life completely. Like what? Like there was a film called The Warrior. I was doing television and I was bored of acting and I wanted to uh, quit this uh, profession. And uh, I was losing passion for acting. And at that time that film came and I lived with that film for three months and suddenly, you know, everything changed for me. <laughs> everything changed. I was I rediscovered my passion and uh, I was longing to work in film, cinema, not in television. After s finishing the shoot, I couldn't work for six months and I was easy with it. I was not, you know, anxious or my wife was a little anxious. I'm sure, right. But it had fulfilled because, something uh, in you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it I does something to you. And, and that's the point of being in, uh, in this business of storytelling, you know, and listen until it does something to you you know, uh, it should it should mold you. I'm wondering how the film A Mighty Heart, which you were in with Angelina Jolie, changed you. That's obviously a very important story to us here at the Wall Street Journal because it tells yeah, about no. the abduction of Daniel Pearl, a journalist here, and, and his murder um, after September 11th. How did you prepare for that role? You know, knowing they're very real people you were representing, these weren't fictional people. And, and was that a hard movie to make? Well, it was a hard story to to know that something happened like that. It was a hard, hard, hard story to accept that we have to play that. You rarely come across these kind of things. What attracted me to the book was uh, Marion Pearl's attitude towards the whole tragedy, her vulnerability, right. and still uh, examining herself all the time. Yeah. Because she's writing a book, you know, when she got the perspective on that, definitely. But still what comes across from the book is something very new. That a woman who's going through this tragedy, but is still trying to keep herself intact. Yeah. You know, emotionally, right. although she's so vulnerable. And that vulnerability was her heroism. Hmm. And I don't know whether the film could, could, could capture that or not. Is there a role you crave to play uh, in Hollywood, is there a role you haven't played that you want to play? 
it's not just Hollywood. As an actor, you have so many things, so many, so many prototypes. I, let yeah. me call it, you know, in, in your in your personalities, and what uh, this business does to you, you know, the, it lets you play those prototypes, lets you live those prototypes. You know, there might be a joker inside me, there <laughs> might be evil person inside me, there might be a rock star inside me. You know, a rock star inside you. I can <laughs> see you as a rock star. I can see your next part as yeah. that. What about Pi? Did that character just jump onto you? No, no. It was the this part was so slow to come to me it was refusing to come to me why do you and think that is i don't know i couldn't i could I, I can now i can you know i can find out uh, reasons i can give different reasons but i think this part was asking me to redefine my method the way i approach the character you know it, it because it was demanding to work on different levels to have a command on the book itself is such a humongous task right. So, you know, this, this part really uh, asked me to work, it, it really needed, I needed to work on a different, different levels and, and that took really time, it took a lot of time. Well, the movie's getting great critical reviews so far. Irfan Khan, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate it. And finally, taking an acclaimed book from the printed page to the silver screen is Fraught with Risk. Which attempts have proven inspired and which ones, well, rather idiotic? Our own Wall Street Journal film critic Joe Morgenstern is here with his list. The Scarlet Letter, The Godfather, Alice in Wonderland. When popular books make it to the big screen, there is a lot at stake. Now, one of the latest to test the waters is The Life of Pi. Just what makes an adaptation work? Well, we are going to talk to our own Wall Street Journal film critic, Joe Morgenstern, who has put together his list of the most inspired to most idiotic books turned movies. Now, Joe, you got a sneak preview of The Life of Pi. Now, without tipping your hand on the review, tell us a little bit about what you thought. Well, you know, if I didn't think well of the movie, Wendy, I, I, I wouldn't step on my own review for it. <laughs> uh, it's one of those books that people say wrongly can't be made into a movie. Of course it can. It was begging to be made into a movie. The book is in good hands, let us say. All right. Well, I think we got a little bit of a snippet there. Now, you have some from the past. You picked some current and some not so current films that have done well when they've gone from book uh, to film. Let's start with the most inspired ones, The Godfather, parts one and two. You think these were particularly inspired? I do, and everybody does. I think you'll get no argument on Godfather one and two being the absolute model of a novel to screen. And it illustrates a principle which is that novels, and particularly big, sprawling, episodic novels, make the best source material for movies. I always worry when I see a movie that uh, has a credit saying based on a short story. I think I'm going to come out hungry. <laughs> All right, Fred, that's a very good point. Now, From Here to Eternity, you also found this one inspired. This, this book had a lot going for it. It won the National Book Award. It was the debut novel of James Jones. Tell us a little bit about why you put this in the inspired category. Jones's novel was a sprawling, I think it was seven, eight or nine hundred pages, but it took a great humanist director like Fred Zinneman uh, and a great Hollywood writer like Dan Taradash to pull all of this into not only filmable form, but to cast it brilliantly. The Easy A, now this was another one you put in into the inspired category. This is Will Gluck's contemporary version of A Scarlet Letter. A lot of drama there. Why did you like it so much? What I loved about it was that here's a, a movie that takes complete liberties with the book, The Scarlet Letter, Nathaniel Hawthorne. But it takes smart, funny liberties in the same way that uh, Amy Heckerling did with Clueless, which was based on uh, Emma. Um, this is rather than a, a, a woman who goes through life with uh, the, the adulteress's A on her, on her breast, uh, this is a young kid, a high school kid, Olive Pendergast, played by the sublime Emma Stone, who brags about her sex life that never happened and ends up being branded as a harlot, but she's a faux harlot 
in a, in a movie that's a true wonder of a comedy. For me, one of the most painful book adaptations into a film, uh, as it was for many people, was in fact Bonfire of the Vanities, a brilliant book in my opinion, many other people's opinions by Tom Wolfe, but it was so widely panned as a movie that it inspired its own book, The Devil's Candy, about just how bad it was making that film. Let's move into what you thought was idiotic, uh, Joe. Alice in Wonderland, talk us through that one. Alice in Wonderland, the Tim Burton version, had all of the vast apparatus of the digital age at its command, all of these marvelous effects, and Johnny Depp playing a Jack Sparrow version of the Mad Hatter, and yet there was no magic. It was basically a very earnest Disney movie, uh, a coming-of-age movie uh, in the standard Disney fashion about a heroine who emerges from her difficult experiences stronger and wiser. Now, speaking of magic, Joe, Cloud Atlas, this is a new film. You talk about sprawling. How do you begin to translate something as complicated as Cloud Atlas, the novel, into film? And it seems to me you think they have not done that. This is another novel that was said to be unfilmable. And in this case, they were right. The real problem was that Cloud At Atlas, the David Mitchell novel, was a time-traveling novel. Uh, somewhat about the theme of reincarnation, but not entirely. And this was not just a time traveling movie, it was a time hopping and leaping movie that every, I don't know, 45 seconds it seemed, as soon as there was any danger of the audience getting involved in a particular segment, we would hop somewhere else. And finally, Joe, on your idiotic list, the adaptation <laughs> of Anna Karenina. Now that novel was widely regarded as, as, as just sort of the pinnacle almost in, in, in realist fiction. What did you think about this adapt, latest adaptation? Well, let me say, Wendy, on this one, I regret the, uh, the category idiotic because uh, Joe Wright, who directed Atonement, who's a very gifted director, uh, made a brave and completely wrong-headed attempt to adapt Anna Karenina by reminding the audience of the artifice in film, but not just the artifice in film, reminding the audience by putting it all into artificial theatrical trappings. An alienation, an intentional alienation device to remind the audience of something it doesn't need to be reminded of, that movies are, hey, artificial. Interesting. All right, Joe Morgenstern, he is our Wall Street Journal film critic. You can hear from him every Friday in the Wall Street Journal. He's even won a Pulitzer Prize. Joe, we love having you on Off Duty. Thank you so much.